Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. I'm always intrigued about people that can put thoughts and words together, be it a blog, uh, write a book, anything like that. It's amazing how it all comes together in the end. I found somebody that doesn't just work as an author, but she's a freelance writer and editor, and she also helps people publish their material, or if you want somebody to write it for you as a ghostwriter, she'll do that as well. She's the the woman behind Hen House Publishing, and she's back with us. Karen Smith joins us on the program. How are you? Fine, and thanks for having me again. Yeah, it's great to have you back here. Now, we talked about that side of your life. It's interesting how one side is the, I guess, the the the, the mentor to the publishing aspect of it, helping somebody along with that. But then there's the author side of you where you have an affinity for writing, whether it's somebody that commissions you to write something or you just write on your own for pleasure or for profit or whatever it might be. How do you decide what you're going to write? If it's you yourself, let's say somebody's not asking you to write, Hey, I got some science fiction ideas. Here they are. Put it together. If it's the other side and you're going to write, how do you decide what to write about? Um, a lot of people will find you know, will say, "Hey, I have an idea," and ideas are cheap and plentiful. You can pluck an idea from anywhere. Um, so, what makes an idea valuable for me when I'm writing for myself is whether or not it sticks. How do you mean that? Well, for instance, um, a few years ago, I was watching a movie and I really didn't like the ending. <laughs> mm. And I had an idea that just kind of sparked from that. And it basically, it, it stuck. It sort of pounded at me. And it's like, I've got to write this out or it's going to drive me insane. So I started writing. And, you know, less than two months later, I had a story. That was that was a really powerful idea. Um, other ideas take a while to sort of marinate in my subconscious. And when they do that, generally, that's a good idea. Um, doesn't always work out, but those, those tend to be the best ones. So when you took the, the lead from the ending that you didn't agree with, uh -huh. did you write a new ending or that crummy ending inspired a whole new idea that what made me wasn't even truly related to what you did? The, the book that came out was not actually related, <laughs> you know, to, to that movie. Um, here's another, here's another example. Um, when I was in college, I was compelled to watch a movie called Blowout that was made, I believe, in the late 60s. Um, I had to watch it twice for two different classes, and I hated it each time. But the premise of that movie just kind of stuck with me. It's basically about a uh, high fashion photographer who unwittingly photographs a murder. Mm. And... That premise of a photographer who unwittingly photographs a murder stuck with me. I hate not. I still don't like that movie, but the premise stuck with me. And, you know, finally it just came out I had, and I wrote the story. <laughs> wow. Huh. Now, you, you make me think here. Is it a good story idea when it's easily explained? That seems very easy to explain. Somebody photographed unknowingly or unplanned a murder. Mm -hmm. I got it. And now we build around it. If it takes a long time to explain, well, we've got this and then this happens. And then, then there's also, is it usually not the best idea if it takes a long time to explain it? I don't know if it's, if you can say something, the best idea more along the lines of it's, um, it's an inability of the author to condense it down and consolidate it you know, into a, a simple explanation. Um, every author I've ever met has that problem. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, we all have that problem. And um, I've, mm. I've sort of come across some generic explanations. When I'm at an event and someone says, well, what's this book about? And my response based, you know, for some of them is um, it's a love story. That's what it's about. Mm. You know, the, the circumstances surrounding the love story that make it unique and wonderful and different 
that's just, you know, that's, that's all extraneous stuff. That's not, you know, all those circumstances do not make what that story is about. That's what makes the story interesting. Hmm. There's many love stories out there. So that's got to be a challenge too, to come up with one that's going to be unique. Like what, what's, what's special? Uh, what's special is uh, when I'm working with other authors is what I tell them, you know, it's like, there are no, there are no new stories. Really. There aren't. <laughs> hmm. Um what makes each story unique is that author's spin on it. How does the author say it? How does the author envision the circumstances surrounding it? Um, the author's use of language. Okay. You know, it's, it's, it's that author's treatment of the story that makes that story fresh and unique again. What's- I mean, how many, how, how, how often have you seen, a, a a a revised version or, or a different version of Cinderella or Beauty and the Beast or any fairy tale. There are thousands of them. And each one is unique in its own different way. Right. But essentially, it's the same story. Essentially, it's the same story. Hmm. Exactly. Well, I mean, look at songs. A lot of times, other songs are sampled from back in the day in a newer song. And you're like, well, you know, that sounds familiar or... You have a connection to it. You don't know why, but it it just works for you because mm-hmm. it's the same stuff. You know? Right, right. <laughs> so, um, you know, what was it? I, I forget how long ago. Probably at least a decade. Uh, Alan Jackson did Mercury Blues, and at that time, I hadn't realized that he what he did was he redid Mercury Blues. It had already been redone by someone else who had redone it from the original. And each version was extremely different. Wow. <laughs> I got to look that up. Huh. There's a, you know, talk about country. There's, I can't think of the artist. I'm not a huge country fan, but I'm listening the other day. I'm like, that's David Bowie, Rebel Rebel. One, a song that came off one of his albums. It was pretty popular. It wasn't a huge hit, but it's very distinctive. Like the guitar riff, uh-huh. that's that song. And yeah. sure enough, he just calls it a tribute to David Bowie. And he just, you know, I don't want to say he ripped it off, but, you know, he's using the, But I got to say, I'm connected to it. I, uh-huh. It's got that familiarity to it. So I guess it's the same thing if it's a Cinderella love story, but maybe it takes place in uh, outer space. I don't know, you know, in a different yeah, realm exactly. or whatever it might be. Uh, exactly. Exactly. You know, it's it's it's. You know, each each author tells the story a little bit differently. Think about how um, a joke, all right? Someone tells a joke or you tell a joke to somebody and that somebody repeats the joke, but it's not quite the same. Right. And that person, it's it's it just kind of, you know, changes as it goes. Sometimes it gets a little better. Sometimes it doesn't, you know? I was watching uh, a show last night. One went mentioned which one is. It's a husband and wife and they do a uh, remodels of houses and uh-huh. he tells a joke, and I'm like, sounds familiar. And then as he tried to explain it more, I'm like, that's an old joke. It's, a, it's a, <laughs> He watered it down because he had to explain it, but it's the same way as an old right. joke. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's that's pretty much the way it goes. Have you ever been asked to do a story, write a book, whatever mm-hmm. it might be, and you said, no, this is just not, I, I this is not me, or I just, I'm not interested in it, doesn't feel right? ever happen i i have been i have been uh hired to write stories and i basically thought the story premise was entirely absurd but it was one of those deals where well he's going to pay me to write it i'll do my best okay you know so we, we you know that that comes along and you know as as if the if the person hiring me believes in that idea that that story and is willing to invest in it, then the least I can do is go along for the ride and do my very best. If someone tells me a story as, or, or, you know, something, I would like you to do this. And I am just entirely disinterested or if it's something that I don't do. Uh, for instance, I don't ghost write memoirs. I know people who do and they do a good job, but that's, that's not my bailiwick. That's, that's not that it, that entails some uh that entails a level of interviewing and questioning people and pulling out information mm. that 
I don't do well. Hmm. I don't blame I would, you. Yeah, you know, I would. I would rather. I would rather talk to someone and bounce ideas back and forth about. Okay, what are we going to do with the next chapter of the story? Then try to pull information about someone about his business practices and his uh, and his life circumstances and in his childhood. That you know that that to me to me that's really invasive questioning. I don't enjoy it. Hmm. I I don't blame you because you're writing somebody else's story, um, and there's so many facts involved that you need to corroborate and make sure it's accurate and all of that. It's a different situation when somebody says write a book about a talking cat. I'm being hypothetical here. Right. I understand. Yeah. Um, is that challenging when somebody commissions you to write, you're the ghost writer, they mm -hmm. have the idea and along the way they look at it and said, no, I don't like the way that sounds. I don't like the way that is. I mean, how does that whole process work? Cause that could get to a point where it's like, why am I doing this? I mean, you know, this, they have a different vision than I have for this story. Well, it's it's very much a give and take process. Um, it really is. Um, and sometimes we'll come to a point where it's like, this is the hill I'm going to die on. <laughs> and other times, you know, it's like, you know, it could go either way. And I'm not I'm not I'm not going to fight this. Um, I once had a client who had me ghostwriting for him. And he basically returned a chapter that said, uh, you know, his, his comments were, you need, this, this is all tell it's, there's no show. And I rewrite it and I thought, this is pretty much all show. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. Um, so how, I, how do you define that? How do you find that, you know, all tell no show and vice versa? Um, I, it's, it's subjective is what it is. And it really is. Um, but when you're, when you're looking at something that is written in pass basically in passive voice um and the quick way to demonstrate passive voice is saying my sister was eaten by penguins is in the object acts upon the subject instead of saying penguins ate my sister okay all right the second one is active voice and it's a lot stronger it, it's got a lot more punch to it but that's that's the general concept is active voice tends to immerse the reader and bring the reader into the story and to to feel what the characters feel, to react, you know, to to what's there. When you're when you're writing in passive voice, generally, what you're doing is you're inserting distance between the reader and what's going on in the book. The reader does not become emotionally involved. So anyway, hmm. you know, he 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 said this is all tell and no show, and I was I was displeased, and. Um, suggested he re reread it <laughs> and he did reread it and he came back and he, and he, he apologized. He said, I, I don't know what I was thinking. I must've, you know, I, I must've been in a bad mood that day or something, but this is really good. It's wow. like, Ew. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, I guess that's also the frame of mind that you're in when you read something, because you're going to, depending on where you are that day, uh -huh. internalize, interpret it in a, in a different way. Oh yeah. Hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I was, I was uh, reading a book last night. I got to about the, about a third of the way through it. And I finally just, it's like, I can't deal with this anymore. This is boring me to death. And it's, it was pretty well written. You know, there were some things and it was kind of like, oh, well, the, the heroine in this is a ninny. <laughs> and that was, the, that was just the word that came to mind. She's a ninny, you know? Um, And I set it aside. It's like, it's just, not, I'm just not going to deal with it anymore and I'll go on to something else. Um, so when I'm writing, I, I try to keep those things in mind as well. Uh, you know, the, with, with the characters, I don't want, we don't want a character. That's what we call a Mary Sue, who is a character without flaw. Hmm. We want a character to be multi-layered and complex, like a real person. So you have to have a character that has some flaws. Um, this is so above my pay grade. I understand what you're saying, <laughs> but I wouldn't even know where to begin to make sure that all those pieces come together. And I guess that's why it's an art. It's a craft to put a story together. Take me through the process when you're writing. Huh? Is it always chronologically done or do you often 
switch from here to here. Um, like, for example, let's say you're on chapter two, you're talking about the, the childhood of somebody. And I don't mean this in a negative way, but maybe you're getting bored. Like, eh, I've, I need to circle back to that. You know, I'm, I'm, I need to get maybe a different frame of mind. I'm going to go to chapter what could be, maybe you don't give it a chapter number, but I'm going forward because now this character has grown up. Do you write that and kind of piece the whole thing together at some point? There are some authors who do that. Um, there are basically three kinds of authors. Hmm. You have the plotter who plots everything out, you know, I mean, you know, we writes you know, an outline and does who does what, when on the outline. And it, 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 they can become very detailed. Um, that's a plotter. And you have a pantser and I'm a diehard pantser. Uh, this is someone who just, you know, the, the idea strikes, I start writing and it just goes. When I go to the second draft, I may add in more at the front end or somewhere in the middle, but I don't, I, I just, I just progress until I'm done. But you do, that sounds like a start to finish. Pretty much. Yeah. Hmm, okay. Pretty much. So I don't, and then there's that kind of middle person who um, I've heard termed a puzzler who kind of puts a story together, like a jigsaw puzzle, a little bit here, a little bit there, and then eventually it all comes together. Hmm. And uh, for that, that approach would uh, would really discombobulate me. I, I I can't do it that way. I don't think I could either. And I'm trying to look at both sides of it and how it would go. But I agree with you because I would start getting confused. And it seems on the back end that it would be more work because you'd need to double check your facts. I mean, if you're going in chronological order, call it that chronologically, you've got if a progression. Yeah, you're, if, you're, if you're in a linear progression, it it to me it's to me it's simpler. It's easier. A linear progression is, Seriously. Um, you know, but it's other people don't work that way. There's no one, there's no one true and righteous way to do this. Sure. Sure. Yeah. It's whatever, whatever works for you. And again, you may just not be feeling the beginning of the book and then yeah, let me, let me go further in. Do you ever do any other types of writing? Like, like, let's say websites copy for those. I have done that. Yes. Hmm. Um, I've, I've, uh, I've done website copy. I have, written uh, copy for brochures. I've done event programs. Hmm. Um, I've done uh, numerous blogs, numerous blogs, including my own. Um, so I've done those. I've done uh, social media posts for other people, LinkedIn posts primarily. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've done them. Yeah. Um, I've, I've written white papers and case studies, things like that. I, uh, I don't know if I share it with you, I have a marketing company and the bane of my existence is copy for websites. It's, <laughs> and there's been times where I've written some of that copy takes me probably 15 times longer than it would be for you. And yeah, I'm not saying it's, it's fantastic, but it's good. It's solid. Um, but again, there's a lot of facts, fact checking, um, it could be a medical website. So yeah, it could be, um, you know, liposuction. So Got to do the research. And once you have all the facts together, in my mind, now you can weave the story, if you will, the copy around the facts. But you got to get the facts accurate. Right. Uh, oh, but- you do. You do. Whether, whether, you're, write, whether you're writing uh, a, fiction, you know, a fiction story, you know, short story, novel, whatever, or whether you're writing website copy um, or a textbook, whatever, it's... <laughs> You've got to get the facts right, and it really it, it irritates me when people don't do that. It, it, it's it's one of those things. Um, I've been doing this a long time. Um, you know, I've been doing this for over thirty years, mm. and in that time, I've learned a little bit about a lot of stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when something strikes me as wrong, it's probably wrong. <laughs> And it's kind of like, okay, if I can look this up on Google in 30 seconds and figure it out, then so can anyone else. And that just means you're writing a, you know, you, the, the writing is sloppy and the writer just is careless. And that, that infuriates me. I get you. Yeah. It's, it's almost as if you insulted the reader by not doing your homework and fact checking. 
they, let's say it's a website, they went to learn or understand about something, Mm -hmm. and now they're halfway through, but they see an obvious error in fact. It's like, really? You you, you, you couldn't even check that or typos. And I'm not going to say I don't do typos. I'm the worst. I'm the worst proofreader on the planet. I, 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 I loathe it. I don't like proofreading. Um, but when you see one, it's kind of embarrassing when you see it, you know, especially on a website or whatever. Oh, yeah, it is. It is. Um, and I'm the worst person to proofread my own work. Sure. And I keep telling other authors, you know, especially those who are worried about the costs of editing and what have you, it's like, look, you're the worst person to edit and proofread your own work because you're too close to it. Absolutely. You know, I know that from experience. Um, my first my first uh, few books, I thought, well, I'm an editor. I don't have to hire an editor to do this. Yes, I did. <laughs> yep. You know, someone someone pointed out, it's like, ah, uh, you you got a you got a, some 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 big big boo boos in here, and I went to that page, just like, oh my word, how could I have missed that? Well, yeah, you know, that's what you get for editing your own work. Isn't it funny when that situation comes up? The first thing, and it's not a defense mechanism; it's a no, I don't, can't be, because <laughs> you spent the time in writing it, and you just assume, oh, it's not going to be, you know, maybe there's a maybe a typo, but there's not, you know, there's not major problems like that. Um, and then you see it and it's like, Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, and it does, it does get, it does get embarrassing. Um, sure. And uh, that, that was a thing that uh, basically was the, the kick in the tush that I needed to say, yeah. hire an editor. And um, I have been with the same editor now for, I think um, 10 years. Wow. Wow. And she is, when, when we first started, it's funny because when we first started working together, she was very cautious. And I told her, be brutal. It's like, you're not going to hurt my feelings. The public has already done that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you're doing me a favor. You understand that you're doing me a favor by shielding me from the public when it comes to that. Right. Well, and, you know, and, and I, and I tell, you know, authors who are afraid that, an editor will be candid with them because um, I have had a client or two who hired me to edit and then was a then was offended when I pointed out all the problems. Um, it's like you're not hiring me to flatter you. That's that's not my job. Right. Hmm. But so when I hired her, and it's like just be brutal, be candid. Don't don't sugar. You know don't 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 dump sugar on me. Don't pussyfoot around it. Just tell me, be blunt, because if you're just hinting, I'm not smart enough to get it. It's a different situation. <laughs> like, honey, honey, how do I look in this dress? This is a different situation. <laughs> you, may, yeah. you may need to change how you're going to phrase the the reply. Um, love talking today and, and seeing this all from a different angle of how somebody like you works and and puts together these things that we read for enjoyment. Karen, how do we how do we find you? What's your website? No. Okay. I have two websites. Uh, the first website is my freelance website. If you're looking for an editor or a proofreader or a book designer or a ghostwriter, and that's henhousepublishing.com. And if you're looking for uh, some fun stuff to read, then I suggest you go to my author website, and that is hollybargobooks.com. You got to believe that somebody is watching or listening to this and is going to go to the second website and say, I'm going to find a typo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they're in there. You know? <laughs> it's real. You are real. We're, you know, it's, it's, that's yeah. what makes it real. Uh, yeah. We don't, we don't, we don't strive for perfection. We just try for excellence. Exactly. I got to, I got to remember that and put it up on the wall. Uh, thank you so much for today. Really appreciate it. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I've enjoyed my time with you. Same. We'll be right back. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Hey, Dad, how do airplanes fly? What's in this box? Can I touch this? Where does sand come from? Is this tree good for climbing? What happens if I mix these two things together? 
How are babies made? What does this thing do? Kids are curious about everything, including guns. Talking to them about gun safety in your home is a good first step, but you can do more. Always keep your guns locked, unloaded, and stored separately from ammunition. Storing your guns securely is the best way to prevent family fire, including unintentional shootings. For more information on safe gun storage and ways to keep your family safe, visit endfamilyfire.org. That's endfamilyfire.org. What do we keep in the attic? What's this thing called? Can I ride my bike backwards? Like I said, kids are curious. It's up to us to keep them safe. Brought to you by N Family Fire, Brady, and the Ad Council.